Eight minutes before eight is the time. Now, we've talked about the problems they've had in the sectors of retail and, indeed, the sector of travel. One other one that has taken a hell of a buffeting is, of course, the theatre world. But there is more money on the way to the arts from the Culture Recovery Fund. Culture Recovery Fund. And here is Culture Secretary Oliver Dowden, a Conservative MP, to join me with more details. Good morning, Secretary of State. Uh, to where is this additional money going? So now we've got the money up over a billion pounds actually in the hands of arts organisations. So this latest tranche, for example, will see 20 million pounds going to the National Theatre, 20 million pounds going to the Royal Shakespeare Company, 20 million pounds to the Royal Albert Hall, 40 million pounds to our historic royal palaces. All of these are precious parts of our cultural landscape and it's ensuring that we preserve them for future generations but also ensure jobs as well. We think about 75,000 jobs will be protected through doing this. And, and how do these organisations qualify for the cash, Secretary of State? So they went through a, a process, if you remember, a few months ago I announced the £1.5 billion Cultural Recovery Fund uh, and we, we set up a committee uh, chaired by Damon Buffini, a very experienced uh, person with experience in banking and so on, who went through and rigorously scrutinised all the applications to make sure they were value for money and delivered what, what we, we wanted to do with this, which is to save our precious cultural heritage. And we're also now saying that from today, we'll announce the final further tranche of £400 million, which will help in this next phase, which is what I hope to see is through spring and summer, we'll see a reopening of our cultural institutions, and this money will help them on that path. Well, I'm sure we'd, we'd all echo that. While I have the benefit of you with me, just a couple of questions on, on other matters. You seem to be getting into a war of words with one of the stars from The Crown, Josh O'Connor, who plays Prince Charles, says that your request for Netflix to show a disclaimer on the programme, which one has to say does to be far more, seems to be far more fiction than it is fact, uh, is a low blow, particularly at a time when the arts are struggling. Secretary of State. Well, first of all, uh, I, I believe it's actually talked about uh, the, the arts struggling. He, he went to the Bristol Old Vic, which got um, £600,000 from the Cultural Recovery Fund. And I think there's a range of views amongst the, the actors on the Crown. But the point I was making, I have huge affection for the Crown. It's actually produced in my constituency and it's beautifully produced. But it is the case that it's a work of fiction. And if you look at a BBC or an ITV show, they frequently have a, a thing at the beginning. Many of your listeners will have seen it saying that, that this is a work of fiction or it's based on facts of work of fiction. I think it's perfectly reasonable for Netflix to do the same thing. Um, talking of the BBC, one of the former veterans there, Andrew Neil, claims that the Martin Bashir documentary set a chain of events in place that led to Diana died the death of Princess of Wales after the paranoid princess got rid of her security detail. Secretary of State, what needs to happen with the BBC and this Martin Bashir inquiry? Well, I think it needs to be taken exceptionally seriously, and I'm very glad to see that Tim Davey, the, the new Director General, has appointed a former senior judge to carry out a rigorous investigation into it. I think we should let that rigorous investigation happen and then see what the consequences of that are. But could Andrew Neil be right in what he suggests, that this could have fed the paranoia of the late Princess of Wales? Well, well, let's get to the, the facts, and that's why this uh, senior judge has been appointed to, to look into it. I don't think it would be helpful for me to speculate until we find exactly what's happened. Everyone's speculating about what might or might happen on Sunday. Obviously, you're closer to the information as regards to the post-Brexit world between the EU and the UK. Now, the former Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has said last night Australia's relationship with the EU is not one from a trade point of view that Britain would want, frankly. You've, as in the UK, chosen a very courageous time to leave the largest free trade zone in the world. So an Australia-style solution, which is really a no-deal Brexit, it's not what we really voted for, is it, Secretary of State? Well, I would much prefer that we had a free trade relationship with the European Union like that that we have, uh, Canada has with the European Union. But that can't be achieved at any price. And there are two areas of significant difference that remain between us. It is worth saying, by the way, the Cabinet was briefed on this uh, yesterday and we discussed it extensively. We are 90% of the way there, but the, the remaining areas are quite tricky. First of all, there's no country in the world that doesn't retain control of its sovereign waters, its fishing uh, rights. So we, we need to see some movement on that. And secondly, there's no other free trade deal in the world, whether that's a deal that EU has done with Japan or that they've done with Canada, which says that if the EU chooses to change its regulations, 
the other country, in this case the United Kingdom, would have to follow suit or face the consequences. And the, the fear that we have is that will keep Britain in the sphere of influence in the European Union and mean that we haven't genuinely left. So that's why the Prime Minister is remaining firm on those points and has the full backing of the Cabinet in doing so. But, but how embarrassing is it? The Prime Minister refers to an Australian-style deal and the former Australian Prime Minister saying it's not something you'd want, you'd be very courageous to take it on, Secretary of State. Well, as I said, our preference would be that Canada-style deal, but it can't be achieved at uh, any price. It's interesting, for example, today that the, the Labour Party seem to be indicating that, that we should accept this. Well, I don't think we should accept those kind of terms. Appreciating your constituencies just on the outskirts of London, how close are we to a possible Tier 3 placing for London? And might we be looking at testing as well of school children in counties such as Kent, Essex and possibly Hertfordshire? Well, on the two points, first of all, in relation to the, the tiering, uh, your listeners will know we set out the tiering the, and uh, in the run up to the 17th, as we will do uh, periodically, we'll assess where the evidence is and see whether those tiers remain in the right place or whether we need to increase or, or decrease the level of tiers. Obviously, I very much hope that uh, London doesn't have to be uh, increased to tier three, but we will have to act on the evidence. On the point about testing, uh, this is a really important area and uh, Many of us, and myself, I have to remind myself of this, that one in three people who have COVID are asymptomatic. They aren't showing any symptoms. And that's why testing is so important and why we're rolling it out to school so we can identify those kids that have COVID and aren't showing the symptoms so then they can self-isolate and we can stop the disease uh, spreading further. Was it a mistake to open the schools when the government did then, on, with hindsight, Secretary of State? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, I, mean, I have school-aged children myself, and I'm sure many of your listeners do as well. We saw how terribly difficult it was for them not being at school. It's vital, particularly for kids from deprived backgrounds, to get into school, and that's why we prioritised it. A um, couple of last points. Are football spectators wrong to boo or jeer when players take the knee prior to kickoff? Well, look, I, I think uh, whatever the players uh, do uh, should be respected. But my focus as a minister is actually tackling challenges of racism in football. So, for example, uh, last month when I started this process of looking at the fan-led review, one of the first items on the agenda for the meeting was to look at how we tackle racism. And we had representatives, for example, Kick It Out and others, of anti-racist bodies. That's where my focus is. Right. Would you take the knee? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't choose to take the knee myself, but I perfectly respect other people that, that, that choose to do so. My focus as a minister is actually on tackling some of the remaining challenges of racism. For example, I, I found it extraordinary, some of the evidence that I heard, that actually the number of black managers is now lower than it was 20 years ago. Now, there's huge talent uh, amongst the black players. That should be translated through to the leadership of football. And lastly, a conversation with you and your position of culture secretary on a day such as today can't really take place without asking for a brief reflection or recollection of the career of Dame Barbara Windsor. It died aged 83, an incredible body of work all the way from the 60s until relatively recently through Carry On and EastEnders. Oliver Dowden. Well, I, I think we can safely say that Barbara Windsor was a national treasure. I grew up on the Carry On films, as I'm sure many of your uh, listeners did, and they brought so much joy to so many people. And then, actually, as a member of parliament for uh, BBC Elstree, I, I say I'm the MP for Albert Square, and I think <laughs> I can safely proclaim that Barbara Windsor was the finest landlady the old Vic ever saw. And then in later life, she's done great work campaigning on dementia, so she will really be, be sorely missed. All right, grateful for your time. Oliver Dowden, thank you. Secretary of State, Culture media and sport appearing here on LBC where at eight o'clock the news is next with Thomas Watts. On your radio, on Global Player and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at eight o'clock, Dame Barbara Windsor has been described as a national treasure following her death at the age of 83. The actress, best known for her role in EastEnders and the Carry On films, had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2014. As well as film and television, she worked in theatre, making her stage debut at 13. Speaking in 2015, Dame Barbara said she felt very lucky to have been honoured by the Queen. Because I love what I do and I love my, you know, and I, you get, people stop you in the street and say, here, tell us about so and so. And was Kenny Williams really like that? And oh, say, 